Good morning. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth. That is what I want to focus on this morning. And um, doesn't seem like it took very long for our stay here in Pennsylvania to be coming to a close. Um, Lord willing, on uh, Friday a week, we will be heading back to Alaska, back to the camp where Elaine and I have been serving uh, the greater part of each year since 2007. And uh, he's enabled us to continue to do that. And so we will be flying out of here um, in a few weeks now. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to continue to shine upon you and um, use you for his work here in this community. And wherever you may go when you leave here. Um, so that's our prayer for you, and we appreciate your prayers for us, too, as we go up there and do our mission assignment there. Well, last week I uh, referred a bit to your banner up on the wall, Regeneration, Sanctification, Divine Healing, and Second Coming. And uh, I appreciate you having that in front of you from week to week, Sunday to Sunday. And it helps you to keep that focus in mind. And Jesus is coming. That is, our, that is our hope. That's what we are looking for. That's what we are living for, focused on. And uh, sometimes it can... Um, be forgotten maybe and pushed aside with all the the humdrum of life a lot of things uh, that come along that distract us from that but that's one of the reasons the scripture says that we are not to forsake ourselves the assembling together as some are in the manner of doing but to come together and encourage each other and all the more as you see that day approaching and that's what he had in mind that day is approaching, and I believe it's approaching very, very rapidly, okay? And I'm going to be sharing with you this morning my convictions on this uh, topic that is somewhat controversial um, when you talk about eschatology and the last days and times. Um, we don't all come out of the same place. But uh, it's a passion that God has placed upon my heart for over 50 years now that I came to my attention that God was doing things in our world that relate to the scriptures. And, and I believe that. I, I, I'm like Peter in that sense. That's the only sense. <laughs> like Peter when he said and they, in Acts where they tried to keep him quiet. And they were out on the streets of Jerusalem. They were preaching Jesus there. And the Sanhedrin said, stop it. No longer speak in this name. And Peter said, I'm sure the others agreed with him, we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. And I tie that in directly with what I want to try to share with you this morning that as I read this and as I observe what's going on, I cannot help but speak the things that I have seen and heard. So this is, um, this is a goodbye sermon uh, for a while. We don't know what God has in the future. And I never know when we leave if I'll be coming back in the fall again or not. Uh, Pastor Glenn, I'm sure, will be here with you. And I don't know what they will organize. And so... It's not a guarantee that I'll be back after we come back, but uh, so for now, it's it's a it's a goodbye sermon, and I want to encourage you to keep looking up, as uh, Sister Lori read there, uh, that our redemption is drawing nigh, and I want this to be an encouragement and a reminder uh, to you this morning. 
I do take the scriptures uh, what I call literally. Uh, I read them and what it says I tend to believe which means that I'm not one who, you, who does a lot of figurative interpretation of the Bible or symbolic. There are obviously times when you need to do that, when it is meant to be symbolic, figurative, and not perhaps literal. And we usually know when that is. That's usually quite clear when it is not to be taken literally. When John the Baptist saw Jesus walking by and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Uh, he wasn't referring to a four-legged animal walking by, uh, which you would take it because of the language he used there. We know he meant a two-legged man, the Son of God who became flesh was walking by. So it's usually obvious when figurative symbolic language is used. And so I feel that when I stand before God, it'll be very important that I have spent my time preaching and teaching what the Bible teaches. And if what I said literally, God meant it to be symbolically, figuratively, and not literally, then I think I'll be in a better position than if I explain away what it literally says and says it doesn't mean that it's something symbolic and figurative that would be a more serious situation as I stand before God and give an account to him of what I have conveyed to those that God has opened the door for me to do that with such as right here this morning so what I'm going to do Lord willing is uh, is focus uh, on some scriptures today, and Laurie read some of them that we'll be looking at, and then asking the question, Jesus is coming, think about it, okay? And along the way, if I remember, I'll be asking you to think about what I said, and then you, you decide, you decide, okay, uh, if what I am saying seems to tie in the events of the day and the words of scripture. Um, to me, they're a great encouragement. Maybe you haven't seen them that way and, and may not come out of the same place. But here we go. We'll look at the scripture. And um, Matthew 24, uh, Lori read from, uh, from Luke. I'm going to begin just with one verse in Matthew 24, then go to Luke 21, and then come back again to Matthew 24. So it'll be a little bit of back and forth in our Bibles here this morning. But beginning, I go to verse 3 in Matthew 24 because I, uh, I appreciate how Matthew has written down what the disciples said to Jesus when they came out of the temple in verse 1 and were walking away and uh, they came up to him and they called his attention to the temple and the other buildings that were very beautiful and as you know by this time Herod had expanded the temple perhaps even more glorious than what Solomon's temple was. Solomon's temple was destroyed. Zerubbabel's temple when Ezra and Nehemiah went back and rebuilt. Uh, we know that the second temple was not near what Solomon's was originally. The old people who remembered the first temple wept the young people who had no recollection of the first temple were rejoicing just because they had a temple. So there was rejoicing and there was weeping together that could be heard a long way off. Okay, but by the time of Jesus' ministry here, Herod uh, had expanded the temple in, in, a, in a huge way and it was quite a structure. So I'm thinking maybe one of the wonders of the world at that time. So they naturally got Jesus' attention focused on the temple, on the buildings. And they said, uh, and Jesus said, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone will here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. That had to be a shock to them when he said that. So they asked him a question in verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, verse 3, the disciples came to him privately 
tell us, they said, when will this happen? That is, when these stones will no longer be left one upon another. When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age, the end of the world? Wouldn't that be maybe one of the questions we might pose to him if, if, God, <laughs> if God was among us and knew everything? Um, that was their question, especially after he told them about not one stone being left upon another. Their question was, when will this come to pass? Now, I, I'd like to call to your attention, I have a red letter edition Jesus' words in red. Maybe some of you have that too. All the rest of chapter 24 and all of chapter 25, Jesus spent that much time answering one question. When will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming? He spent two chapters. It's the second longest discourse recorded in the Gospels. The Sermon on the Mount is a little bit longer than what he took to describe and talk about the significance, again, of his coming and the end of the age. That deserves some of our attention, which I want to give us here this morning. So going back to Luke 21, Luke chapter 21, where we had some reading, scripture reading done for us. Um, Beginning in verse 8, and I'm just going quickly through some of these scriptures here, um, just to kind of get the idea of what uh, Luke records that Jesus said when the question was asked about some of the signs and when these things will take place. Uh, Jesus began in verse 8 to say, Watch out that you are not deceived. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he. The time is near, and so forth. Do not follow them. You'll hear of wars, revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first. But the end will not come right away. Well, it's been 2,000 years at this point. So, um, the end is not here yet. And he said it would not come right away. And he said nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places, and these things have been happening down through the years, nothing new. And in recent days, recent years, we've been having them. Fearful events. I believe here he moves to the end of the age when he says fearful events and great signs from heaven. That he may have had in mind there moving down toward the tribulation time, possibly. But then he goes into verse 12 and says, But before all this that he just mentioned, they will lay hands on you. Now he's focusing on the disciples. What's going to happen to them in the days shortly coming up? They will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. And we know history tells us that only John of the disciples survived and lived out his full life and gave to us the book of Revelation at the age of maybe 90, 95 years of age. The others, according to tradition, have all died at the hands of their martyrs. Okay. So Jesus said, you'll be handed over. This will result in your being witnesses to them. Verse 13, 14. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves I know for I will give you words and wisdom and none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict you'll be betrayed even by parents brothers relatives friends and they will put some of you to death all of men will hate you because of me not a hair of your head will perish by standing firm you will gain life of course, referring to eternal life because most of them did lose their physical life. Then he says in verse 20, he moves up about 35, 40 years from the time that he was speaking here when he said, When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, 
This is referring to the very well documented 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Romans came in and wiped out the city, just like Jesus said it would happen. You will know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. This is a time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. And if you go back to chapter 19, you'll see that Jesus spoke these words to the city of Jerusalem as he looked over it. And he said in verse 1944, they will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That was a judgment, a prophecy pronounced on Jerusalem because they did not receive him as their Messiah, okay? So Jesus is saying here now, just a bit later, that their time is coming when um, this will happen to the city. Uh, how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. And so it was as they were driven to all the nations of the world. Verse 24, the first part of the verse, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations okay that is documented that has happened and again we say all the things that the prophets have talked about that Jesus has prophesied that has already happened why would we be skeptical why would we be faithless regarding the things that are yet future for us then in verse 24 the last part of that verse Jesus said Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In Jesus' day, Jerusalem was still being trampled on by the Gentiles. The Romans were in charge. As a matter of fact, you know, historically it is documented that from the time that the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, 2,500 years ago, give or take, from this date today, Jerusalem has always been trampled on by the Gentiles. The Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottoman Empire, the Crusades, you know, on down through history, the Jewish people have not had complete control of their city, Jerusalem, and I've always been influenced and under the influence and trampled on by some other sovereign power. That is until 1967. Now think about it, okay? I'm, I'm trying to put together what Jesus said that the Gentiles would be trampling on this city until their time was up, all right? In 1967, we know in the Six-Day War that Israel got control <laughs> of the entire city of Jerusalem for the first time. They went to the wall. They celebrated. They knew why they were celebrating. This was the first time in all these centuries, millenniums of time, that they now had control of the eastern part of Jerusalem. In 48, they had the western city, but Jordan still had control of the eastern city, the old city of Jerusalem where the Temple Mount is, the Dome of the Rock, and so forth there. And now, for the first time, a little over 50 years ago now, they gained control of the entire city. Think about it. Is that what Jesus had in mind? Or is there still some future date coming yet in the very near future when Gentiles will again, in a crisis coming, uh, maybe it's not quite at that point yet, okay? But, um, we, you know, it, you, you wonder, verse, and then you look at some verses that follow here, uh, like verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth, nations will be in anguish, perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. I think the last time I was here, I mentioned briefly about the oceans, the, the storms, the hurricanes. 
uh, unprecedented hurricane we had a year or two ago that was off the charts as far as strength is concerned. And U.S. News said some time ago they did a, they did a study from the 60s on up to the present date there has been an alarming increase. This is U.S. News and World Report gave that report. Is that indicating? Uh, is that tying in with what Jesus said? That after Jerusalem is no longer trampled on by the Gentiles, I mean they are, they have given the control over to the Palestinians at this point, if you know the, what's going on in Jerusalem right now. But it's under Israel's sovereignty. They can do with that what they want. They choose to give that part over to them. Men will faint, verse 26, from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. At that time, when the waves and the seas are tossing, they've tossed before, they've always been tossing, probably, but when you see the accumulation, the increase, okay, earthquakes and famines, all these things have always been happening, but there will be an increase as the time gets closer and closer. Jesus said, when you see this thing begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. That is what we are looking for. If we say it's going to get worse before it gets better, you know what that will be, but we're trusting the grace of God, the strength of God, to be able to take us through whatever is coming, because on the other side, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, it's going to be heaven on earth. He's coming. He's coming back. Second coming, right? He's coming back to this earth. Um, going back again to Matthew chapter 24 and uh, picking out a few scriptures here regarding what Jesus said when they asked him the question about the sign of your coming in the end of the age. Uh, in verse 14, for example, in Matthew 24 and verse 14, one of the signs that Jesus gave was this. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, uh, it's interesting that they tell us that uh, the gospel has gone to all nations. Uh, some interpret this to mean that everybody will need to hear the gospel. Okay, and that might be correct. But there's another idea out there that says uh, that Jesus is really referring here to all nations hearing the gospel, that that is the requirement for his return. If that is the case, then we can say that at this time, all nations have heard it. Not all the languages within those nations and tribal units and so forth. Wycliffe, we know, is working hard to produce more translations. There are still many languages that have not heard. But in every nation, the gospel has got in there, and every nation has been exposed to the gospel, if that's what Jesus meant. Um, going down to verse 15, the next verse. So when you see standing in the holy place... The abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel. Let the reader understand. Now here we have an interesting scripture. He refers to Daniel. We go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And this is where Jesus is referring to. He is, he's affirming what Daniel said. Daniel said it first. In Daniel 9, 27, he talked about the man of sin. He talked about the Antichrist coming okay, on the scene. A man at the end, the trip, bringing on the tribulation time, the time just before Jesus comes. In fact, he will be here when Jesus comes. Revelation 19 talks about Jesus coming out of the heavens on a white horse and all the armies of, the, of heaven following him. And he then defeats this man of sin. Revelation 19, read it sometime if you haven't lately. He defeats the man of sin. He takes the Antichrist, the false prophet, and they are cast alive into the lake of fire where they spend all eternity, right? This man of sin. Daniel gives us 
a bit of information about that person in Daniel 9, 27, when he says that he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, a seven year period. In the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering and on a wing of the temple, there's only one temple ever, on the wing of the temple, which is not there yet, okay, on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Again, that's in Revelation 19. Daniel is the first one to talk about this man in this way, going into the temple and, and causing this abomination in this holy place. He doesn't say what will happen. He just says it's going to happen. Jesus comes along, what we just read in Matthew 24 and verse 15, and affirms that Daniel, well, what Daniel said was going to happen. There's going to be an abomination that causes desolation. You go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and Paul gives us the final update on what Daniel talked about and what Jesus affirmed when Daniel says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus, verse 1, and being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. That day of his coming will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, again, Revelation 19, and then verse 4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That is the abomination. Paul eventually brings us up to date of what Daniel first wrote about, what Jesus affirmed but didn't give in more detail, Paul, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, says it will be this man going into the temple and declaring himself to be God. Blasphemy. Wow. Right in the temple, God's temple, that's reserved for him and him alone, this man will claim to be he. Okay? So, what gets very interesting here is if you've been following the news and so forth uh, is that the temple is probably soon going to be built just this morning I went online not looking for this and they showed a picture of the Ark of the Covenant that they have made to go into the temple when the temple is built. The Ark of the Covenant goes in the Holy of Holies. They have all the other furniture, the menorah and all the other furniture is already in place. The priests have been chosen, they have their garments, they're all fitted up and they are eager. The Knesset in Israel has voted in favor of the temple when it can happen. Because on that temple mount is the Dome of the Rock, that big gold and there's the mosque there and, and uh, the Palestinians at this point are given control of that area. And initially, just, you know, they, they do not want a temple there, of course. But if temple is coming, God says it is, and the man of sin is going to go in there. So what it gets me excited and eagerly looking for him who is coming is the fact that in the making, the plans are drawn up, there's a peace plan going to be given. Our president right now and his son-in-law are working on a peace plan. We don't know what it's going to be, where it's going to go, how effective it's going to be. Some believe, some believe it's going to have to do with the Temple Mount, sharing it, sharing it, share, right, share, sharing the Temple Mount and putting that temple on there. All I know is this, when the plans are in place or when the construction begins to happen, 
that building that's going to go up is going to be the building that the man of sin mentioned throughout scripture is going to go in and do his thing. All right? Think about it. Think about it. Don't take my word for it. Read the scripture. Go online. Go to some of the uh, Breaking Israel news. You can go on there. There's, it's an it's a Orthodox Jewish website. They are just excited about their temple being built. Okay? We don't agree with the temple, right? I mean, we, the temple sacrifices, they're, they're done. Jesus, it's finished once and for all. He was nailed to the cross and he shed his blood. And Hebrew says, there's no more need for that. No, we're not rooting for the temple because it's something that we have to go into and be a part of. No. Uh, Jesus, once and for all, took care of the atonement process there. But God has blinded, hardened the hearts of his people Israel up to this point. Romans 11 says that. And that veil one day will be taken off when all Israel is saved. But right now they still feel the need to get those animals and offer their sacrifices. And it's coming. Um... Going down to verse 21 and 22, it is another sign. For then there will be great distress. Think about this. The days we're living in, there will be great distress in that day related to his coming, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equal again. It'll be so bad that if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. We know man is not going to destroy this earth. They have the capability, they have said for years, to do it over and over how many times, right? With these horrible weapons they have developed. And we know uh, the nuclear scientists have developed this doomsday clock that they, ever since, ever since the World War II, when, when, when nuclear weapons were created, the atomic bomb, they had it at quarter of 12, midnight, meaning it's over, we're done, we're finished. They have been moving that clock up, up, up. It's now at two minutes till 12. It's a hopeless thing to them. They see no way out. They see it coming very quickly, the, the destruction of mankind on the earth. It's not going to happen. Jesus said it won't happen. To us, it's marking the fact that it's getting to the place where no one will survive unless he shortens the time and intervenes. And uh, just one more thing in Acts chapter 1, as Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, the disciples were with him, uh, only a few moments left, they didn't know this, he went up unexpectedly, but in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? And... Um, if Jesus, if, if it was not God's plan for the kingdom to be restored again to Israel, that would have been a time for Jesus to say, well, the time is coming when the church will replace Israel and, uh, and you people will be done. You have rejected me. Not one stone will be left upon another. Your day is over. It'll be all done. Uh, there'll be no such thing as a restoration again of the nation of Israel. But he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, it's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Why did they ask the question? Because nine out of the 16 prophets from Isaiah to Malachi have talked about the restoration of the nation of Israel. And I'll just share one very briefly. Um, let's see if I can find it here. The book of Amos, the last part, as Amos closes his book out, he says, and this is one of the nine that has emphatically stated that in the last days, Israel will be restored again to her land. Of course, we, we're witnessing that. Isaiah says, I'll bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. 
They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in her own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, declares the Lord your God. They couldn't have meant when they came back from captivity the first time because they were uprooted in AD 70 and they were sent out. But now they're back, 1948. A miracle, a modern day miracle where 600 whatever thousand soldiers that Israel was able to pull together with a bunch of used weapons facing five enemy nations coming against them. Against all odds. You know the story. They're there. They're back in their land. And today they're a world power. They have power which I don't think anybody even realizes to try to defend themselves against the onslaught that's out there now of Iran and all that we know about and hear about today. Zechariah said, the time is coming when his feet will again stand on the Mount of Olives, the very same place where he ascended from. He's coming back there again. And if he'd have come back, if he'd have wanted to come back 100 years ago or 80, you know what, Israel's been there, what, 75 years now, 80, 100 years ago. If he'd have came back prior to the regathering, there'd have been nobody there, right? He came to his own, his own did not receive him. He's coming back to his own again, and they will look on him whom they have pierced. They'll mourn for him, and all Israel is going to come to him. Every knee will bow. We sing about it, and we read it in Scripture. Every knee will bow, including them, and that day is coming for the nation of Israel as well. So he is coming back to the Mount of Olives, and it is getting ready. The city of Jerusalem is getting ready for him. I mean feverishly. The, the infrastructure, they are building roads you have a high-speed rail from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. 25 minutes you can be there. And one of the main purposes of that high-speed rail and the new roads, even gondola lifts going into the Temple Mount are in the making because when the temple is built, Jews from all over the world and Christians, there will be an outer court to the temple. Christians will want to go to the temple and they'll come from all over the world to handle the influx of people will be impossible without developing their infrastructure, which they already in the, uh, already are doing that. So, um, think about it. That's my take. That's what I see happening. That's what I read in scripture. I, that's what I'm reading uh, on websites and places, what is happening. Uh, they are feverishly moving toward the coming of their Messiah who they don't hold to be Jesus, I'm talking about the Jewish people, until they look on him and they'll recognize him then at that particular time. So those who are looking for him, Hebrews 9.28 says, to those who are looking for him and waiting for him, to those he will appear again the second time without sin unto salvation. By all means, keep looking, keep looking. The second coming, the second coming. Um, He's on his way. Somebody said, you know, it's time to actually stop looking for signs. They're all over the place. Start listening for a shout. Shout. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. When he will descend and the dead in Christ will rise and all those who are alive will be caught up in the other in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so ever, ever to be with the Lord. That's what we're excited about. And then verse 18 of that second 1 Thessalonians 4 says, encourage each other, encourage each other with these words. That was my intent. I hope it happened this morning. God bless you. Thank you. Amen.